so yeah, maybe you, I know your backstory. I've been a big fan of you for a while, <laughs> but uh, if you could maybe give the listeners maybe like a little rundown of what got you to where you are. Sure. So, um, you know, I came into the game of golf and, and doing this kind of serendipitously. Um, you know, I was a baseball player in college, struggled with my own goods, the bads, the uglies. Um, the uglies was losing my mechanics and losing my confidence in what I was doing. Um, and the, uh, I really wanted to have success. And I, I kind of was one of those guys that did everything right, but just never seemed to get the success. Um, and that was hard because, you know, everyone says if you follow the process, you do everything you're supposed to, success will follow. Obviously it didn't. And I started having some success and got injured. Um, and, you know, I, I had to deal with, um, you know, the, I had to deal with the the frustration, the loss of confidence in my mechanics. I had to deal with the, realization that other people were moving beyond me and my time to pitch was gone. But, um, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's important that we, you know, understand in everything that we're doing that, that there is no guarantee of anything. I mean, we know that, right. There's tremendous uncertainty that we're facing on a regular basis. And what it taught me was how to turn into the mental side to look for an advantage. It was the only thing I had. I had lost the physical side um, and it, my physical side wasn't quality enough to pitch at the SEC levels. So I had to find an advantage and find a, an avenue to defeat people. And I had turned to a guy in my fourth year that, you know, was a, was a mental coach. And, and, and he really took me through the, the, the process that I could follow. And the process really was about competing for everything that was in front of me and not assuming that um, if I just took care of business, it would work out because really the taking care of business thing was really more along the lines of putting out the fires, you know, I think so many of us and including me get caught up in if I take care of all this, if I fix this, if I fix that, then I'll be successful. The reality of the fact is that we all have flaws, but it's, it's about what's our ultimate intention. And I had to switch my intention. That's why I decided after I was done playing at LSU, I was like, I'm going to be a psychologist. I didn't know what it entailed. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know anything about it. Um, I switched my major going into my senior year into psychology. I remember sitting down with the academic advisor and she's like, I think it's a great position for you. I think you'll do great at it. But do you realize how many people apply for grad school and how many people get in for clinical programs? So a clinical psychology program is on average a five-year program. You do your master's and your doctorate at the same time. It's the best way to describe it is from an applied field. Um, you're doing clinical work to learn the clinical skills, but also doing the academic formations. And then you're also doing research. So a PhD program like I was in is going to be heavy research and the ultimate combination of the scientist practitioner model. And so I ended up after a couple of years switching to a professor who treated us like med students or residents. So we were in the hospital 30 hours a week working on the medical units. We didn't work in the psychiatric facility, worked in the medical units or in the primary care settings. Um, I also worked a you know, 15 to 20 hour a week job and then had classwork and then research. So, you know, I was, there were days I was getting up at six for rounds at one hospital and finishing it at six at rounds at another hospital. Um, but it was great because it was the ultimate immersion in the human dynamic and the experience between the good, the bad, and the ugly for individuals and helping them understand the ups and downs that they go through. And when I finished, I did my training at, at so I, so real quick, back to what started that was, I was sitting there and I was like, I'm going to do this. And her answer was very few people get in. They get about 300 to 500 applications. They're going to take 10. And they really don't want you to go to the school you did your undergrad at. And my wife was, a soon-to-be wife, was in nursing school in Baton Rouge. I had no chance. I mean, I had to go there. And um, <laughs> so I just went all in and it was like, look, I'm going to figure out a way to do it. And, you know, it was all about not what if. It was about how am I going to do it? How am I going to get in? And I got in. And, and then from that, I just I felt like I was always the – I was always the underdog. I didn't think people believed I had the ability to be there because there were better, more nationally ranked candidates that were coming in. And I just wanted to outwork them. And then during my first year, we found out my wife was pregnant. So at the end of my freshman year in grad school, we had our first child. And then um, that changed the dynamic. And thankfully we were near home and we could, you know, have parents help out. But, you know, when I went on internship, it was the same thing. I had a chip on my shoulder. I, you know, I, I went to Brown Medical School um, to do their psychology training. It's a one-year, 12-month internship. And, you know, you look around and there are people there that are, you know, unbelievably published. And I had publications, but they were so much stronger. 
and I just was always put on the chip on my shoulders that I was going to out prepare, out, out develop, out earn every single one of them. And they're all great friends and colleagues, but I was, it was a com- competition for me. And then I ended up doing, finishing my training there and had some opportunities to work with athletes up there. Cause my advisor up there wanted me to do that. And then, um, I went in the pharmaceutical industry for eight years doing research and development. And then while I was doing that, I just started seeing clients on the side and people would call me in Birmingham and say, look, I know you work with kids uh, or I know you played sports. I know you played baseball. You've won a couple of national titles. I know you play golf. Can you help this kid out? And then one thing led to another, to, to another, to another. And next thing I know, I was working with tour players mm. or you know, top ranked amateurs in the world. And just really don't, I really didn't take the approach of, this is my system. My system was about the person and I was helping the person believe that they were capable of achieving success. It wasn't about rah, rah and in long answer, but I used to sit there and, and read quotes of other people in our field and be like, God, that's so witty or, man, they dress funnier. You know, they got to do this. And I, I, it was like the hell with it all. Just be myself, give it everything I got to every client I face. And, and if I help one person, it's all that matters. Whether it doesn't matter what level they're on. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you play on your high school team. It doesn't matter if you're a, you know, the last player on the soccer field, okay, at the level you're at, or you're a world champion or the number one ranked player in the world, you're getting the same me, mm. you know, and, and yeah, there are different intricacies that are there. But I think that's something that I learned that got me to this point of being, being authentic to who I am and the way I serve my clients. Right. So with that, like, it's not a system, it's per player. Obviously, that has its like, you it's not a one size fits all, but how do you, I mean, maybe I'm asking you to like how the, how the machine how works, but yeah. How do you do it? Of like, so, my, how do you so I do customize? have a system. I do have a okay. system. I have a philosophy. Okay. Got it. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is I don't, if somebody comes to see me for golf the first day, I'm not going to take them through their pre-shot routine. Second day, I'm going to take them through this. That's what I mean is like, I, okay. I saw and I studied, I felt like a lot of people in our field in a variety of sports would lock into one area mm. and just bang that drum all day. So for me being a clinician, and and it's so funny when I talk to people, like, well, yeah, but clinicians are going to di- die. I'm not diagnosing and treating anybody. I'm done with that. I, I work to help people perform better. Mm-hmm. I'm going to look at it from a biopsychosocial approach. Okay. I want to know your biological background. I want to know your genetics. You know, if I look at you, an athlete comes to me at any age and both of their parents were Olympians and they were from the Eastern Bloc in Russia or okay, what well, Eastern Bloc. They're going to have a different mindset of the way that somebody is trained who grew up with two parents that are artists. Okay. Sure. So I want to know that it's not definite. It's, it, there's no absolutes in what we do. Um, I want to know how they've overcome struggles and injuries in the past. I want to know, then I move into the psychological, what are their belief sets? What are their irrational beliefs? What are their um, problem solving skills? How do they focus and, and deal with challenges? Um, can they, can, what's their grittiness? What's their mindset um, to fight through stuff? So I'm going to assess and that assessment is going to be done on a day by day basis. Um, and then the last one is how do they work socially? How do they, how coachable are they? How do they treat people that are above them and below them in the quote status line? Um, you know, how do they view themselves? How do they carry themselves? So my factors in that, and then I'm going to look at one other major thing. So to me, success is across four factors. Number one is we all have skills and talent, but we have to work to develop our skills and talent on a regular basis. You better have a concise and consistent training plan in order to train it. Okay. Because the second factor is I don't care how good you hit the ball on the range. I don't care how well you do other stuff. Can you do it under pressure? Can you do it when the heat is on? And to, you know, to, to think that, you know, people don't um, have straights and, you know, um, and any, you know, anything like that, um, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, anything that you've, um, you know, that you've got to do is, is focus on um, the mindset and the process of, um, hang on, I just got a, one of those good. quick You're texts. Good. Do your thing, do your thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, I get it. It's like, um, you, I, I struggle customizing my help per yeah. player. Cause I, well, you know, I have what I experience and you have what you experience. So how it's 100%. like, so, yeah. so the point is we all have our stresses and whatever, but then the next thing is we have to have mental flexibility and I'll come back mm. to what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You got to have your ability to be mentally flexible to the challenge that's in front of you. And then the last thing is you've got to, you got to understand the randomness and the uncertainty that's happening in the game. Okay. So when you're talking about your experiences, your experiences are authentic and true. 
Mm. I, I had a coach teach me a long time ago that said, or tell me something a long time ago that said, when coaches are first teaching in the game of golf, and let's use instructors, they teach what they know. They teach what they did. Mm. Then they teach the newest thing that they've learned from the, the biggest name teachers. And then they start teaching the player. Mm. Okay. And that's true, right? Yeah, that's very well, true. When I started out, I taught people what I knew, mm. right? Um, I hoped I'm teaching the player, not from a sign of wisdom, just from a sign of my default. But, you know, what I want people to do is to, you know, even when we're teaching people how to play the game is to ask them, Hey, what is, what is it that we're going through? What, what do you feel when I say this, you know, what is it that, that we're doing? Right. Um, right. You know, um, and, and what is it that you see here? You know, right. You know, I think the hard, um, the hardest thing that we have to do is when somebody goes inside the ropes or competition mm. is to realize that you and me and what you do, we're not the gurus. They're the gurus. What, what, what am I doing that's really going to help them in the heat of the moment? In fact, one of my clients on the PGA Tour, Billy Horschel, puts it perfect. And he said it at first. And, and, and I think he kind of said it as like, ha ha, funny. But he said, you know, I don't. I don't know when we, when we work, I don't know exactly what we work on, but right. I don't have to think about it when I'm in the heat of the moment. I just mm -hmm. know I feel clear focused on what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I told him, I said, that's the greatest compliment you can give me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you're not having to think, okay, Brett said to waggle right. the club here. Checklist. It's, it's a checklist. Instead, it's here's the challenge. Mm -hmm. Can I find my best to match that? Right. And can I accept the outcome? If we can do that and understand how we all take care of those factors, Everybody's mm -hmm. going to do it differently. If we, if we went to a pizza buffet, some of us would get the vegetarian, some of us would get mm -hmm. the no cheese, some of us would get the heavy meat lovers, some of us would get <laughs> the spicy one, some of us would go purely for the dessert one. That's really cool. Our job as a coach is to, one, realize, even in the middle game, who's good for us and who's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, I refer people away from me all the time because I just don't think they're a good match. Or we do it the opposite way, which is we bring them in and then it doesn't work. Right. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's important that, that we understand that also from a coaching standpoint, when people come to work with us, they are going through something. We need to solve that problem. Sure. We often want to run ahead to the biggest issues. Yeah. But sometimes that's the only issue they have. Huh. When I was doing clinical work, I had a, a patient that came and saw me and I was still in training at the time, but a um, lady came in, she had the clearest case of Obsessive compulsive disorder I've ever seen. True obsessive compulsive disorder is pretty rare to this level. Now we we laugh about perfectionism. That's not what right. I'm talking about. I'm talking, you know, washing our hands today pre-COVID. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking washing them with bleach. I'm talking, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, pure and simple intrusive obsessive thoughts with compulsive behaviors to solve it. Mm -hmm. And I go out and I come back in. I'm like, Hey man, listen. And she had been having some depression and stuff like that. And I said, Hey, look, you know, this is what's going on. You got this obsessive compulsive disorder. And I was so excited as a, as a, as a trainee, because I was like, man, I get to see this. This is amazing. She never came back. And so about two weeks later, my advisor asked me, he goes, Hey, whatever happened to that patient? I said, yeah, she never came back. He goes, well, would you? She came in because she was depressed and not sleeping. You tried to address something that wasn't even in her. She had had obsessive compulsive disorder for 30 years. She didn't understand the connection. You need to help her sleep. And huh. it's a really powerful statement. When people come to us, we need to help them solve the problem that they have. Okay. And I see this in swing coaches all the time. It's like, oh, I got to rebuild that swing. Why? <laughs> yeah. Why? They're obviously at a certain level. Well, they're going to have problems down the road. Really? Mm -hmm. How about just, you know, Chick-fil-A doesn't argue that they don't sell cheeseburgers. Right. Okay. There are certain play courses on tours that players, some players struggle to win at. Okay. Super. You know, so you've got to understand as a coach solving that problem. And then if you gain their trust, then you can start building the platforms for other stuff. Right. And I've got players that'll come with me, even on the PJ tours, like, Hey, look, I've got this one issue. I want to solve that. And I'm thinking in my mind, Oh man, I can do it. I get what they need to move on. Yeah. You know? And that's okay. Yeah. You got to bite your tongue. Cause we, like you said, we have to realize we're not the gurus. We, yes, we're, we have skills and we have like the textbook answers to a lot more things than they can even think of, but we could clog their pipes with too much. And they come in and say, you know, I really struggle like 
coming back after a double bogey. And, and I'm like, Oh, okay. Now what else do you have? So like, let's make a project out of you. Right. And that's yep. like, that would be fun for me. And I have to like put myself in their shoes as if like back when I was a player and say, what would I want? I would want to come to someone and say, I struggle coming back from a double. Like that's what I want to fix. Right. So that's, that's, I, I haven't thought about that. I'm, I'm thinking, I think way, maybe too holistically as a default and to shift to like, let's fix this problem and, and then we'll work on something afterwards. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's huge. Um, but, but I think, I think the important thing there is to also realize is that it is not about us. Right. We, we have made coaches, um, you know, the, the, um, the absolute greatest answer person. Mm. Okay. Right. Right. But, but we've made Bill Belichick the guru. Okay. Mm. But what they don't recognize about Bill Belichick is the fact of who are his assistant coaches that he is empowered and trusted to do the job. Right. Okay. Right. Now we've done that because we see people, you know, we, we see a, a Butch Harmon teach or we see a Pete Cowan teach. They don't teach the same way. Mm. Right. They, they, you, they utilize differences and they utilize what they're good at. And there are players that have gone to Pete Cowan that haven't got, who leave and go, ah, whatever. And there are mm -hmm. people, but at that time, maybe they weren't ready to hear what a Pete Cowan had to offer. Sure. But at the same time, you know, you go to a Butch Harmon, okay, and people go, well, you know, he's the greatest thing ever. It's like, no, Butch Harmon is the greatest at understanding you. Pete Cowan is the greatest at understanding you. They have great knowledge. It's their application of how it matches and connects to you. So one of the things I always tell coaches and something that I have to practice on a regular basis, right, is can you, can you learn from every interaction you're in mm. so that when it's over, the, the challenge is, um, is that you got better, but also understanding that everybody's brought into our life for a reason. And our job is to learn the lesson that that person brings to us. Now, some people stay in our lives longer, but have you ever had those people you come in your life and you're like, this is going to be a lifelong thing or we're going to be, and then you just move in different orbits. Right. Okay. Um, and, right. you know, you look at that <clears throat> um, and you understand that, um, you know, it's, um, it's just understanding the value. And so sometimes I tell people, it's like, listen, when we step back, you have to look at it and say, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. I worked with Kevin Chappell for two years on the PGA tour. Mm -hmm. Kevin made me such a better psychologist, such a better coach. Um, I almost look back and I'm going to say, I'm, I'm not apologizing, but he, he challenged me in every level to be better. He did it in his way. Sometimes was fun. Sometimes was not, but his excellence and greatness that he is as a PGA tour winner and one of the best ball strikers on tour. Mm -hmm. I wasn't prepared. I, I, I say then, then he taught me more hmm. about excellence. He taught me more about readiness. He taught me more about being the mind of somebody who's at that moment when, you know, he's very intense. And then we go off the course and he'd be like chilling out, talking baseball. Right. But on the course, he was pushing hard. Hmm. So and what did you have I to offer that, in those? Well, it wasn't moments. that, it wasn't that I was failing him. It was just the fact that, I didn't realize at that moment, I think, the value of Kevin and really what he taught me. One is to believe in what I had to say, mm. okay, to stand strong behind what I had to say. Yeah, confidence, right? Confidence. But also the fact that I also didn't need to overcoach him. Hmm. You know, I think the other thing, oh, I'm going to come in, I'm going to whatever. And really, the dude's a genius. <laughs> he is a tremendous, mm. tremendous competitor. Right. And love that guy to death. I mean, every time I see him, it's still, mm -hmm. we're still, we still hang. So, I mean, this is, right. is right. I walk up, I'm like, you know, when he won in San Antonio, I sent him a long message. And I said, dude, I, this is what I've been dreaming of for you for a long time is that you host that tro trophy because I know what you've done. I know the commitment you've done. I know the other stuff that you put in. Okay. But, you know, I said, I understand at the end of the day that, we've all come in and out each other's lives and you and I are both better because of it. Yeah. We didn't leave on bad terms. Right. Uh, Graham McDowell in the seven, eight years that I've been 
in and out with him and working with him, he's taught me more about stuff. I've gone into him before and, and, you know, looked at him and said, Oh, you know, whatever. And I didn't say, Hey, we need to do this. Right. Okay. And I look and say, what is it like to be in practice rounds with players that he's in practice rounds with? Okay. Um, what is it to be, you know, a player that is the most frequently requested interview on the PGA tour mm -hmm. because he gives an interview. So, you know, where can I really get to him? How can I really help him? Mm -hmm. What did he teach me? He, he, two years ago on my birthday, he took me to a, 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 a public, um, a workshop that was run by Tony Robbins and it had uh, Gary Vanderchuk and mm -hmm. uh, Robert Herchebeck. And it was on my birthday and I went down to Orlando and, and, uh, he took me and then we went to dinner that night with Robert and his wife and his, and then Graham's wife, Kristen. And I'm like, man, he, this is a world of me learning from two of the best in their field. Okay. Uh, Robert, it's not the fact that shark tank it's the fact that he's a digital cybersecurity specialist. Okay. Right, right. And so I'm like, put yourself in those environments and hmm. learn, you know, right. if, if my wife and I were watching a documentary last night on the go-go's, if you haven't seen it, it's on Showtime, it's absolutely incredible. Hmm. And, it's, it's, I, I don't think they're in the hall of fame yet, which is completely an abomination if they're not, but yeah. it was in, fascinating listening to the different roles of each person in the band, an all female band, writing their own songs, playing their own instruments and the genius of what they were doing. Okay. That's how teams work. Right. And, and so understanding my role, my dad was a, a military guy for 20 years near the end. He worked in the, he supported some aspects of special forces and stuff like that. And his thing was always, when the press conference comes on, that's when you leave. So I like to be the guy who's in the shadows. I don't want to be sure. the guy who's mentioned in the, in the papers. I don't want to be, most players don't, most players don't know who I work with. And then other mm -hmm. people. Um, yeah. yeah. You keep you it know. close to the chest. I've noticed. Yeah. You, yes. You've talked more publicly about Billy Horschel, but that, and that's awesome. Like I, I would never say, Oh, he's bragging. No, you come off the far opposite. And well, the only reason I talk about Billy a lot is because Billy talks about it a lot. Sure. Hudson, when he won, he talks about it. So mm. once a player talks about it publicly, I'll talk about it. Yeah. Um, one is to give respect back to them because I did have issues when I first started, when I didn't say anything, players would say, why don't you ever mention me as working yeah. with me? I'm like, okay, look, you know, as a clinician, I would never right, walk right yeah. by you at the Hippa. mall you, <laughs> big time. Yeah. And I still follow that. Um, Billy is quick to thank his team and Billy. One of the things I love about Billy is Billy's team is very, very important to him at a very core level. Mm. A lot of my players are that way too, but Billy's very outspoken about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think, so I'll talk about him um, because he talks about it, but I mean, you know, Pat and Kazire and Brian Harmon and um, guys like that, that have mentioned, you know, I, I, have, I don't, I don't ask them to mention me. And in fact, I'll say, don't, 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 because right, yeah. it's not about me. Don't, if you want to, the greatest thing that can happen is, and I, I'm, I'm mentioning a player, but <laughs> Uses Wofford talked a lot about it in his thing, but you know, right after he won, he FaceTimed me. That was the coolest thing. Sure. Just because it's the authenticity. It's the moment yeah. of just boom. Just I, you and him. Just me and him. And I know what those guys go through. And I know the, the kicking in the shins that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just honored to, you know, I'm still learning with these guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, and guys and girls. I mean, I, the, the, they're, every day that I meet with them, you know, I have a pit in my stomach of nerves to hope that I serve them well. I mean, seriously, yeah, right. every time I go out on tour, I get nervous. Um, yeah. And I go out monthly or sometimes weekly, but I'm like, okay, what's today going to be like? Am I going to be there? Mm -hmm. I was in Jackson this past week. And I had one of those days where <laughs> I had one of those days that many of us go to the golf course and it seems like everybody's co things coming off the club face perfect and you're feeling great. Hmm. I literally walked out there and six of my guys were lined up on the range, essentially. Uh, and they all know these yeah. all guys all know who I was. Right, right. So I was at, and they were like, Hey, go see him. I'm good now. Yeah. And I'm like, by lunchtime, <laughs> I was like, dude, I'm done. Yeah. And right. there's other days that I can't find them at the course. Yeah, sure. And I'm, they're like, where are you at? And I'm like, well, I'm out on the doing a practice. Run. Oh, you're on a practice round with him. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, they're teasing <laughs> me because they know they yeah they know I'm stressed about it. And they're right. like, oh, good, we'll have breakfast in the morning. And so, <clears throat> but that's yeah. the things I worry about. I just want them to know that I am there for them, mm. it's never about me. I'm not out there trying to. You know, I had a call from a. It sounds like I'm name dropping, but I had a call from a media person this <laughs> Do week. It. Not no 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 no. no. Um, I had a call from a media person this week, and she said, "Hey, you know, I've been following you on Twitter for some time, but mm. Hudson talked about you, whatever, and I wanted to call and." She goes, why haven't you ever come out and talk to me while you're out there? And I'm like, why would I? Mm. Like, 
Hmm. I'm not selling anything. I just, right. I, I, I follow you on Twitter cause I love your work hmm. and I'm a fan. And she was like, God, you, we, we got to talk more. I'm like, hmm. okay. I mean, you know, yeah. it, it, it's, it, it's just, I think a part of me is the humble nature of, I love what I do. I love learning from other people. I love studying. I love reading. I love trying to figure out what makes this game tick um, yeah. and go from there. So I want to lean, I want to press into Billy only because I was like, okay, who do I know that Brett works with and who have I seen? And just from a distance, like I, I'm, you should never, I would never tell anybody to judge somebody based on what you see on television. But as as someone in you, you're in my position of the mental side where we would like, I wonder what that guy's thinking right now. Billy, he seems like he thinks a lot and he seems like he thinks a lot about technical things. So I wonder like hats off to you that he's, he's an amazing player and isn't like the stereotypical uh, mental, like Buddhist, simple, you know, he's, he's his own guy. So I just wonder like, yeah, but there's a lot of depth to Billy. I mean, you got to remember Billy's very high profile story with his wife and it shaped who they are and and they're, they walk the walk on a daily basis and um, very connected to, to human psychology and connection um, and, and her walk in sobriety. Um, But Billy, Billy is technical, but that's where he gets his comfort from. So he's very fortunate, not very fortunate, but, he's blessed with an amazing teacher and Todd Anderson. Mm. Um, Todd knows that when Billy's fidgeting and feeling with stuff, it's just the way he works off anxiety. So to me, there are five kinds of um, competitive personalities in the heat of the moment. Number one is the amp up player. You got to amp yourself up. You got to get fired up. You got to be ready to go. You know, look, I'm going to, you know, I got to have a chip on my shoulder. That's the Brooks Kepka's, the Bryson DeChambeau's Mm. um, tiger back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, the second one would be kind of the tactician. Um, that was a person who, regardless of what's going on around him, is going to do the same systematic things. Boom, boom, boom. Sorry, that's more of the Bryson. Bryson's not in the amp up. He's Got more of the tactician. He's going to follow his process in his way. Mm-hmm. Yes, he's going to think, you know, the amp up would be a little Patrick Reed. He's okay right. being the villain. He's okay right. doing that. Um, but the tactician is that person who's, you know, look, it's methodic. It's methodical. You know, I'm going to do the same thing every day. Zach Johnson. Um, I'm going to, I have a process and an approach and it's how good can I do my process? Jim Furyk. Jim Furyk. The third person is I would call is the bubble player. Now this is one where people get confused mm-hmm. because they think, well, I don't know which it is. The bubble player is the player that gets in their own bubble and understands their own ups and downs, but the game is their relationship with themselves. That's Billy. There mm-hmm. are days that Billy's amped up. There's days that Billy's quiet. And, and so there's days that he's a little bit hyper focused on his grip or his swing, you know, when he's over off to the side, I'm not talking to him. That's how he just works out his energy. Mm -hmm. So he understands. He just goes in his bubble and it's his own relationship with the game. Mm -hmm. The fourth one is the warrior. It's the constant warrior. It's the player who would sit there. I'm just going to play terrible. It's going to be awful. It's just going to (laughs) be, but what they're actually doing is they're working the energy off. Now they're puking all over everyone else's shoes. (laughs) So a team like that has to understand that we've got to know that. That was a little bit like a Kevin Chapel. He would worry and we'd all overcoach. And really the best thing to do is say, yeah, I get it sucks yeah. okay yeah. you got it yeah i got it relate to him yeah yeah relate to him that's probably one of the big learnings i have the last one is kind of the let go let god type the Webb simpson types you know i did everything i can just let it go it is what it is you know it's in a bigger power than me whether it's the game the universe god whatever however we see it is i do everything i can just let it rip okay you got to know who they are and and if you ask a player look when you're playing at your best how are you playing man, when I love to play and I'm just talking junk to my teammates and my mm-hmm. friends, then why don't we do that? No, because somebody told me to be calm out there. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, so another piece of bad advice, right? Um, golf coaches who've told forever, you got to be calm. You got to have a clear mind. The word, you know, don't use the words don't. So if <laughs> don't use the word don't. So I hear that all the time. <laughs> all right. That is completely made up. Mm. There's no scientific fact that the brain has, doesn't know the word don't. Mm doesn't i mean you think in our vernacular there's one word that relates to performance that the brain just cannot register no (laughs) what it is is that it creates conflict and we have to resolve it so the more we suppress something the more we're telling the brain that's a problem instead going hey no crap i don't want to hit it in the water so what i tell them is who are you oh you know i just i just work my process i just go through my three-step approach sweet okay 
and, and I'll talk to them and say, look, why don't we get there? Mm. Why don't you, why, why do you think that we're all shocked when Brooks Kepka has to come up with a storyline to get motivated? Right. Okay. He's motivating himself. Okay. Um, why is it that some players want to stay out of the spotlight and they just want to do their job? They're just tactical. Then at the end, they cross the finish line and go, Hey, I'm here. Mm. Okay. That feeds them. Mm. That feeds them. Um, you know, I'd say Spieth was a little bit like that. He was very tactical, mm. very strategic. We have to know who we are. And coaches uncoach a lot of players. They overcoach a lot of players. They confuse a lot of players. Sometimes, why don't we just take them and see who their fingerprint, I call it a psychological fingerprint. Let's just mm. see who their psychological fingerprint is. You know, if you've got three kids from the same family who are all good golfers, <laughs> and they're playing, they're all going to have three different experiences. I'm an only child, so I can't say this, but like my wife and her sister are five and a half years apart. They grew up in two different fa uh, households. Mm -hmm. My father-in-law was starting a business and when my daughter, when my wife was younger, they were pension pennies. The business was successful. So by the time she went to college, they were very wealthy. And my sister-in-law only really knows that. She doesn't remember when they were pension pennies. Not to say that there's anything wrong or different. It's just different right. experiences, right? Sure. So it's the same with golf, right? If, if you grow up, with a situation where you're the second child and every day you go out to the golf course, it's for the first child. And you're the one that's always living around the chipping green. More than likely you're going to be a pretty good short game player. And that's a pretty high profile story. There was a kid out of Birmingham who died, unfortunately in a very tragic car accident about 10, 15 years ago by the name of Bradley Johnson. Bradley Johnson was probably the top junior in the country at the time. And he died unexpectedly in a car accident. And his younger brother is a kid by the name of Michael Johnson, who's played on the Corn Ferry Tour. Mm -hmm. Michael grew up whenever Bradley would go play tournaments, and he would just stay on a tournament site and putt and chip all day. Well, if you ever want to watch him putt and chip, it's, a, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. okay? But his motivations were different than Bradley's. Right. Great parents, world-class All-American parents. Um, but you know, we have to embrace that person who's different. Mm. And we have to say, okay, what is it? What is your relationship with the game? We assume that every player who's playing great enjoys it. And that's not true. Mm. Okay. Um, sometimes, you know, the one thing I learned about working with, with professional athletes and other sports, not everybody at the top of the game is enjoying it. They're doing it because they make a good living. Yeah. Cause they're good at it too. Right. And they're good at it. Yeah. They're miserable surgeons. They're miserable <laughs> fighter pilots, right? For sure. Who are at the top of their game and the select of the select of the select. Hmm. That's fascinating. Like, so it would be so hard to like take from your own experiences and, and say of these five types of players that like the one that gets worried seems to be the wrong mentality, right? Like we would all, if you took a poll on Twitter and said of these five, which one is the worst, like which one would lead to the worst performance it seems like that would be it. Or, or maybe someone would say someone that just has to like be fidgety and like the bubble player, like Billy, like, so I don't know, like, how do you say, I know you said just relate to them, but. Well, I think it's, yeah. I think it's learning them. Right. I mean, I think we assume that the worrier because it's uncomfortable, but, but what's worse, not being able to vent and process that information, sure. Sure. you know, it's, um, if we look at Lou Holtz as a football coach, right? When he was coaching way back in the way, he was the worrier. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, this is awful. This is terrible. It's going to be terrible. We're going to lose. Mm -hmm. And then he would use that. It's kind of like the person who's studying for a test and thinks they're going to fail. And they come out and how'd you do? I was awful. They get their grade back. It was a 97. Okay? <laughs> right. but it's I hated way, those people. <laughs> yeah, we hate those people. Like I said, they throw up all over everyone's shoes, but you can't tell them to relax. Right. You know, it's like telling somebody on an airplane who's afraid to fly, just chill out, relax. It's going to be good. They're like, yeah. Like, the one time that it's not, it's not. So yeah. I think the important thing to do is just to recognize the uniqueness and the, the specificity of each person mm -hmm. and understand that their relationship with the game is their right. It's their experience. And, you know, sure. I'll get parents who will call me and say, Hey, look, you gotta, you gotta help my kid. I mean, look like they're quitting out there. They're giving up. I'm like, well, wouldn't you, if you've got 47 thoughts in your head, it's like your computer does it in the morning when you open up too many apps <laughs> it, it's in spins. So why wouldn't your kid who's, he's just like paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Why don't we say, hey, look, let's find the one thing when you get like that to push through. Mm. Like players never want to have a plan for when it hits the fan. Yeah. They don't want, oh my, I'm not. Like, I'll give you a funny one. So you go out to Sawgrass and you work the Players' Championship. It's a great course. It's fun. It's easy. It's not easy. It's an easy place to work. <laughs> right. But it's not easy. 
You know how many players take practice shots from the 17th drop area? Mm. Minimal. Yeah. And if you ask them, they'll say, well, I just don't want to have to think of that. Really? Yeah. So when you catch one just a little heavy and it ends up in the water, now's the time you want to think about it. Right. Now in the third round is when you want to think about that 74-yard mm. pitch shot over water. And the awesome. first thing that's going to pop into your head is, if I dunk this one, I'm hitting my fifth shot. Mm. Right. Hmm. That's, that's fascinating. And I, I, I want to maybe round two sometime. I want to get into like actual questions people have and, and we're running out of time, but just finally, you've heard this before, and this is a, a dumb question, but I love asking it. What percent of golf is physical? What percent is mental? I don't think it's either or. I think it's all in, in emerged and immersed because if you th- take a step back for a minute, if somebody told you, that you're going to stand over a ball parallel to the target line, mm. looking to the side of it, <laughs> that you were going to take a, an iron stick with a, with a lofted club at the bottom and with a club head, and you were going to swing as hard, you know, for the most part, 110 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, launch it in the air to roll over an uneven surface on the ground with hazards and stresses out. I mean, just think about the mechanics biologically and motor systems wise right. to make consistent. And we're bitching if the ball goes a quick, <laughs> like one of the biggest mistakes that players make. So that's why I think it's immersed. Right. Um, when a player says, I just, you know, I feel like I was saving it out there. Hmm. I'm like, good. Wow, that's awful. I mean, I can't believe I was. Oh, so when you, you miss the bottom step, leaving your apartment <laughs> and you catch yourself and you don't fall, are you mad at your walking ability? All right. No, your brain did exactly what it was supposed to do. Mm. How about getting yourself in a frame of mind that allows it to self-correct? Mm. Let's have clear intention of what we want to do. But if you hit it off the toe and it ends up in the fairway, mm. probably with a little bit of a draw, okay. Mm. But see, the mind goes, oh, you can't do that again. See, right. you've worked so hard. <laughs> like, dude, you've worked so hard that – it's unbelievable that you're with it that like that. Right. You know, that's just unacceptable. That's the judgment. That's the fear of the future. When in reality, it'd be like, good enough for me. Let's go. Mm-hmm. In practice, I want you to have high demand. Like, I'm a big believer of block practice. Okay. All the people who claim that block practice isn't good, fine. Okay, great. But if I'm putting you near a chipping green and you can't hit a ball that lands near a hole, the, near, near a coin, Right. And how in the hell is it supposed to do when the pressure's on? Mm. Okay. And I'm not saying we do it 80% of the time. I think we do block practice 20 to 30% of the time. Okay. Um, right. Don't eliminate it because you've got to have that base level of skill, right? Yeah. Yeah. You've got to have a proficiency. Mm. Oh, no. You just go out and play random. Oh, okay. Good. Good. Yeah. That's great. You keep doing that. My players will keep winning. And that's what I've eventually come down to it is like, yeah, I hear there's a bunch of different ideas and theories. That's great. That's great. One of the things I tell players, and this is harsh to say this, and it's not about me, mm. but I, I, you know, over the years I've had people that have come after me on social media or whatever for different things about what I believe. And I'm like, great. How are your players doing? <laughs> right. And, yeah. and I'm not saying, and, and look, sure. I don't take credit for what my players are doing. I'm lucky to work with the players I work with. I'm just a fly on the wall, but I've looked at certain coaches and it's like, well, man, they've had three or four players that have fallen out outside the top 200 on the PGA tour. Um, and I'm not saying, that, but it's like, there's got to be essentially a, a rubber meets the road there, right? Sure. Yeah. You know what always works when you're truly committed to the player you're working with, not for your system or philosophy, because you care for them as a coach. Yeah. I've, I've sat with players and they're going like, I don't know why they have that coach with them. And I'm like, well, maybe that coach just makes them feel a million yeah. feet. Yeah. And that's sometimes what we have to re- we have to remember is where are we there and what are we doing with the player? We can have all the the ideas. You can talk with an accent. You can wear capri pants out there. You can wear a flat bill. You can do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter if they feel like you bring them value. Um, you know, I I try to go to dinner with my players. I try to I played craps with them. Um, I love to play craps. So you know they'll say, hey, I remember when I first started, I'd be like, yeah, I can't go because whatever. And they're like, come on, seriously. Yeah. Like, come on, we're going to play craps. Yeah. Hudson Swafford and Mark Blackburn and I had an epic night in New Orleans mm. where we all made a lot of money playing craps. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all legal, right? But it, sure. 
Hudson and I still talk about it. Mm. He's like, dude, you remember that night? I'm like, dude, it was literally yeah. one dude got on a 55 minute roll and <laughs> he crushed it. Okay? Yeah. And we walked out together because we didn't, you know, want people to come mug us because of how much sure. money we had in our pocket. <laughs> right. And, but play, you got to do where players want you to go. Like mm. you gotta, you gotta meet them where they're at and not assume it's about us. And, and, and I think, so your question is, is it all physical or mental? Yeah, it is. Mm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Both. Yeah. 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 Well, I, everyone gives a different answer and I, I like them all. So I, I appreciate your time. Dr. McKay, yeah, this has been excellent. Yeah. And yeah, uh, thank you so much. maybe we'll find a time to do another one. We'll see. Anytime. Anytime. We'll, we'll definitely find a time and, and you know, um, have, a, have a good time chatting about all things performance.